Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're going to try and clear up the Coffee Lake Boost Clock Conspiracy. And we're going to do this before showing you the 300 series motherboards, which you'll see very shortly. But before then, I have some extra information on this subject that I'd like to share with you. Before we get to the data though, I would like to just quickly give you a bit of a backstory. So in a nutshell, the claim was that Intel's six core Coffee Lake CPUs couldn't hold the same clock speeds reviewers were seeing on high-end Z370 motherboards as they would on the yet-to-be-released budget 360 motherboards. Although the locked Core i5-8400 and Core i7-8700 have a 65 watt TDP rating, the worry was that they couldn't sustain an all-core boost frequency of 3.8 GHz and 4.3 GHz respectively. At these frequencies, the 6-core CPUs would simply be too power-hungry for a budget VRM to deliver enough power, causing the CPU to throttle down and run at a lower frequency, at which point it could become dramatically slower than what the reviews show. Cooling was also a concern since most reviewers use expensive aftermarket cooling and not Intel's pathetic little 73 watt box cooler. Though I'm not sure this is entirely true for reviews that covered the locked parts. We've only reviewed the Core i5-8400 here at Harbour Unboxed and we did so using the box cooler in addition to some aftermarket cooling. Anyway, in a previous video we bought a few of the worst Z370 boards we could find and test them with the 8700K using the box cooler that comes with the 65 watt locked parts and then compared them to a cheap air cooler as well as a high-end all-in-one liquid cooler. The 8700K is of course a 95 watt part so the cooler was obviously underpowered. However, because the Z370 boards I used were happy to let the 8700K sizzle away at the maximum temperature the cores can reach before thermal throttling kicks in, otherwise known as the TJ Max, the performance drop wasn't that bad. I also tested the six core, six thread Core i5-8400 and found that with the box cooler on budget Z370 boards, it really had no trouble holding the 3.8 gigahertz all core boost frequency after an hour long stress test. So whether you're using the box cooler or a high-end custom liquid cooled solution on the Core i5-8400, performance will be much the same. The 8700K obviously benefits from better cooling as it is a 95 watt part that's designed to be overclocked, but even so a $10 air cooler will have you covered, at least at the stock frequencies anyway. I was keen to purchase a Core i7-8700 for further testing, but I felt like it was probably best to wait for the budget B360 motherboards to rock up and then retest. However, not that long ago, ASRock sent over their new Desk Mini featuring a tiny STX Z370 motherboard, and for testing they also sent along the Core i7-8700, as luck would have it. I thought, what a perfect opportunity to do some additional testing, and, well, the results are very interesting. Just as I was beginning my testing, a long-time subscriber notified me that in my previous video I helped spread some misinformation about Intel's Turbo Core Ratios. As most of you are probably aware, Intel made the marketing decision with their Coffee Lake CPUs to only advertise the base and single core turbo clock speeds. And this is what caused the conspiracy that these CPUs couldn't hold the all-core turbo frequencies that the reviewers were seeing. I myself actually made the mistake of repeating some of this information about the boost clocks uh, without looking into it properly, and as it turns out, the claims aren't entirely true. Uh, the 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 core turbo frequencies are still publicly available and can be read from the CPU's default turbo boost multiplier table. But because Intel isn't advertising them, you have to do a little bit of digging here. Uh, Intel's actually done this in the past though with their Sandy Bridge processors, for example. One way you can quickly and easily read the default Turbo Boost multiplier table is by downloading and installing the Intel XTU software. In the right sidebar, you can see a heap of useful information about your CPU and how it's configured by the motherboard. And you can also see the multiplier table. And here the Turbo Boost values are marked as active cores. In the case of the Core i7-8700 with all six cores active, Intel is indeed targeting a 43 times multiplier for a 4.3 GHz operating frequency. Additionally, you can also see that 4.3 GHz is targeted with four and five cores active, then with three cores it'll go up to 4.4 GHz, and then 4.5 GHz with two cores. Okay, so now that we have that sorted out, it was time to see how the Core i7-8700 got on with the ASRock Desk Mini and its teeny tiny VRM featuring some of the smallest passive cooling you're likely to ever see on a motherboard. Under the laughably small heatsinks is a 5 plus 1 phase VRM, though it proved surprisingly capable despite ASRock limiting CPU support to 65 watt models. 
If you recall in a previous video, I discussed the computer-based review of the Medion Eraser, a pre-built featuring the Core i7-8700 that performed around 10-15% to slower than what was seen by most reviews. Take the Cinebench R15 multi-threaded score for example. The 8700 managed just 1,203 points in the Medion PC, whereas Computerbase's own test system allowed for a score of 1,389 points, that's a 15% improvement in score. At the time, I put this down to the ECS motherboard that was used by that particular pre-built, rather than issue with the Intel spec for the 8700. With those results in the back of my mind, I moved on to test the ASRock Desk Mini, and honestly, I was expecting to find a much better result. But what I got was a much worse result. Out of the box, the Desk Mini was scoring just 1127 points, and that's a further 6% reduction from the Medium PC. So I started to dig into why this was. I quickly realized that the Desk Mini was configured for a maximum package TDP of 65 watts. Now you might think, well that makes sense, the Core i7-8700 is a 65 watt part after all. However, the TDP is calculated from the base clock, not the boost clocks. The 8700 has a base clock frequency of just 3.2 GHz, and here we can see while well, keeping within the 65 watt envelope, it can sustain an operating frequency of 3.5 GHz. 3.5 GHz though is a 19% drop from 3.4 GHz, and this is why we're seeing exactly a 19% drop in score from computer bases 1389 points from their test system to just 1127 points in the Desk Mini. So, does this mean the 8700 is simply too power hungry and will require a higher end Z370 motherboard to achieve maximum performance? Well, turns out the answer is actually no, and I'll explain why. Using the XTU software, I decided to see what the ASRock Desk Mini could do with the limits removed and what kind of risk this would expose it to. Bumping the package TDP up to 85 watts had minimal impact on performance, so did 95 watts, 105 watts, and even 135 watts. Even increasing the current really didn't make that much difference to the score. However, there was a tell here. Using the stock 65 watt configuration, the XTU software detected power limit throttling. Not surprising as the 8700 could only reach 3.5 GHz under these conditions, and that's clearly because the motherboard's power limiting it. Increasing the package TDP to just 75 watts still saw power limit throttling, but interestingly, it also introduced thermal throttling as well, and we are of course still using the Intel box cooler. Then with the 85 watt configuration, we're mostly thermal throttling, and by the time we hit 95 watts, we're thermal throttling exclusively, and this is with the case panel removed. So the box cooler has direct access to cool air outside of the case in a 21 degree room. The Desk Mini is configured to allow for a maximum CPU package temperature of 82 degrees. So the second the box cooler hits that, which pretty much takes one second under load, the clock speed starts to rapidly decline. At this point, I started to wonder what the Core i5-8400 would do using the 95 watt configuration, so I threw it into the Desk Mini with the box cooler and ran some tests. The 8400 was able to maintain 3.8 GHz on all cores after an hour long stress test, and delivered the exact same Cinebench R15 multi-threaded score as it does in our liquid cooled Coffee Lake test rig. The reason for this was that the Intel box cooler kept the 8400 below the 82 degree threshold, it maxed out at just 77 degrees. The next step then was to take the 8400 out of the Desk Mini and then reinstall the 8700, but do so with a cheap tower style air cooler to see if the limit really was the Intel box cooler. With the ultra cheap deep cool Gamax 200T strapped on, I ran Cinebench R15 with the TDP set to 130 watts and the current set to 138 amps. To my surprise, the 8700 instantly sped out a score of 1361 points, which is within the margin of error when compared to what we see on a high end test system using a liquid cooler. To confirm all of this, I installed the Intel Core i7-8700 with the Intel box cooler on a high-end Z370 desktop motherboard, and with the same limits in the XTU software, we get the same results. And with the limits basically removed, but with an 82 degree thermal limit in place, we were limited to around 1200 points. Again, this is with the Intel box cooler. So the limiting factor here is the Intel box cooler, and ASRock has deliberately turned down the package TDP and set an 82 degree thermal limit to avoid winding the thing up to deafening levels, not to save their VRM. In fact, with the Gamax 200T installed and the 8700K cranking out big numbers, the Desk Mini's VRM never went above 50 degrees, even after an extensive stress test. 
With a package TDP of 65 watts, the fan on the Intel box cooler spun at 2100 RPM, and here it was clearly audible, but not outrageous. However, increasing the package TDP to just 75 watts saw the fan spin right up to 3100 RPM, and here it was a screeching banshee. So the entire Intel Conlate conspiracy can be blamed on the Intel box cooler, which is funny because in my last video, I said this. If Intel should be accused of anything, it's that their lock CPUs come with complete and utter garbage to cool them. Their box coolers have almost always been a joke, and the cooler that comes with their 65 watt TDP models is a complete joke, at least when paired with their expensive 6 core models. That being said, I should note there really isn't a conspiracy here, and it's certainly no con job. Yes, the box cooler sucks, there's no arguments from me about that. However, even with the box cooler, the 8700 does exactly what it's advertised to do. It exceeds the 3.2 GHz base frequency at all times for non-AVX workloads, and 4.6 GHz on a single core is also achieved. What it can't do is reach the 4.3 GHz all-core boost frequency using the box cooler, at least under reasonable operating conditions. If you let the 8700 hit 100 degrees Celsius with the box cooler, it will deliver optimal performance. It just does so at a sub-optimal temperature. I can kind of already imagine the comments on this one. But Steve, that's the con job. Intel's not advertising the all-core frequency because the 8700 can't do it with the box cooler. Well, yeah, I kind of get that, but unless they're specifically telling reviewers buy the 8700 and then test it with anything but the box cooler, it's kind of not a con job. As you've seen, Intel states the 6, 5, 4, 3, and 2 core ratios in their XTU software, they just don't advertise them. However, even if they did, this really doesn't change anything. Intel, just like AMD, only states that these frequencies can be achieved when the processor is conforming to its temperature, voltage, power delivery, and current control limits. So in short, Intel doesn't guarantee boost clock speeds. They only guarantee that worst case, the CPU will run at its base clock frequency. Even the single core boost clock, which is advertised, isn't guaranteed, as all the parameters that we just mentioned have to be in check. I never reviewed the Core i7-8700 because I couldn't actually get one when the series was first released. Had I got one though and only tested it with an aftermarket cooler, then that would have been well, pretty much on me, and my review would have been misleading. To properly review the 8700, you really need to do so with the box cooler, and then maybe also show some aftermarket cooling performance as well, because a lot of people are willing to spend $10 to improve cooling performance and, well, performance. In short though, all this drama over the TDP ratings and motherboard power delivery has probably been for nothing. The real issue here is the underwhelming Intel box cooler, at least on the 8700, and nothing's going to change that for the upcoming B360 motherboards. As a side note, I should also mention that this was a best case scenario for the Intel box cooler, as it was fed plenty of cool air in a room with an ambient air temperature of just 21 degrees, so it's likely that you'll probably see worse results with the 8700 in a warmer environment. That said, I strongly believe budget parts like the Core i3-8100 and Core i5-8400, for example, are going to deliver the exact same performance with the box cooler on B360 boards as they do on the expensive Z370 motherboards, and I'm 99.9% .9 certain that this will also be true for the 8700, at least within reason. I mean, there will be some $50 to $60 boards that might not be up to the task, especially those without any kind of VRM cooling at all. Of course, this is true for any motherboard, or certainly any motherboard on a mainstream platform. For example, the ultra-cheap ASRock AB350M HDV, and this is an AM4 motherboard, it doesn't support Ryzen 7 1800X, 1700X, or even the 1600X processor, as the VRM features no form of cooling and can't handle those parts. Anyway, you can rest assured that we'll have all the answers for you when it comes to the Intel budget B360 motherboards in another video very soon. And that's going to do it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content. If you appreciate the work we do here at Harbour Unbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.